So uh, last year, Corinne, Corinne, where are you? Right here. <laughs> yes, because yes, I'm, I'm highlighting something about you. All through spring term in ASI 120, Corinne complained and complained that I did not tell her anything about my personal life. <laughs> this was an ongoing life. And now, who asked us to speak here tonight? And she gets her revenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, a couple things about what we're doing tonight. First, it's going to be, it's a little complicated, it's three stories in one. It's going to be my story, and then Sue's story, and then our story. All right. Um, yeah, it's emotional. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, second, uh, the title of this uh, is Surprised by Grace. And uh, as you know, or most of you know, grace refers to something like unmerited favor. And we have experienced that. So that's really at the heart of our faith journey. So I grew up in uh, Denver, Colorado, and I grew up in a evangelical Protestant church. Now, I'm guessing most of you know what Protestant means, but just in case, uh, the best way to think about Protestant is Christians who are not Catholic and not Orthodox. That really takes care of it. <laughs> okay? Evangelical. You thought that was funny? I just... Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, evangelical uh, takes a little more work. Uh, to be an evangelical, which, by the way, if you didn't know, is sort of the dominant form of Christianity in the United States. Um, evangelical, uh, really two parts. Uh, number one, to be evangelical is to emphasize uh, the importance of being born again, a conversion experience. And second, to be evangelical is to believe um, that you should live your life according to the Bible, and the Bible is... Uh, clear and easily understood and is often thought to be uh, literally true. All right? That's evangelical. So I grew up in an evangelical Protestant church. And um, I was uh, very active in my church. Uh, I was president of our church youth group for a long time. I was president. It felt like a position for life. Um, and our, we were at the, the, our church was at the beginnings of becoming what is known as a mega church. If you know what I mean by mega church, one of the, some of these gigantic churches, you know, where they have a Starbucks in the lobby and that sort of thing. Well, these things are gigantic. If you haven't been, they're worth going to at least once. Um, and our church was en route to becoming a mega church when I was uh, in junior high and high school. Uh, I was president of the youth group. I started that in eighth grade, and there were ten people in the youth group, and when I graduated uh, from high school, there were probably 125 in the youth group. So that's the sort of church uh, I attended, and um, I liked it, but the odd thing is, and I, and I had a serious uh, faith life, um, but as I went through high school, I became increasingly disillusioned about being evangelical. And it had to do, actually, with the Bible. Two things. One, so I'm in this church and I'm told all the time that we need to read the Bible and live according to the Bible and know the Bible. So I took them seriously. Uh, but this was the late 60s, early 70s. And I'm in a church that was against the civil rights movement. I was in a church that was uh, very much pro-Vietnam War, very much opposed to the anti-war movement. Uh, but I'm doing what they say, and that is reading the Bible. And I read Jesus. And their views didn't seem to square with Jesus. So I took them seriously. Um, actually, the, the, the sad thing was what really counted for morality were things basically having to do with sex and drinking. That's, that was morality. The things I'm talking about, like segregation or, or war, that was a part of it. The other problem I was uh, having uh, as an evangelical was that 
began to dawn on me in high school years that while I was told the Bible was clear and easy to understand, I could see that people all over the place disagreed about everything in the Bible. Right? It wasn't obvious what it means. It's a, I began to realize actually that the Bible is a complicated and sometimes weird book uh, and uh, comes from many different sources. It's not the Bible that I was taught growing up. So by the time I went off to my evangelical college, I went to an evangelical college in Minnesota, um, I was already on my way out of evangelicalism, and by the time I was finished with evangelical college, I was no longer evangelical. So I go off to the University of Wisconsin, and I end up, my whole career has been writing on evangelicalism and fundamentalism, Okay, so there's that, but I'm not, I was, I'm not evangelical. Uh, I taught at an even before I came here to UD, I taught at an evangelical college for eight years, but I was not evangelical. Instead, I bounced around from various forms of Protestant churches, trying to find a place where I could feel at home. I even ended up in a Mennonite church, but Sue will talk about that. Okay. Um, but in 19, well, 1996, I was hired here at UD from an evangelical school. I was ecstatic to get out of the evangelical school. I was ecstatic to be here. Still am, actually. Um, uh, and uh, it's a funny thing. I was hired to teach in the uh, history department, undergraduate, and then in the PhD program in theology and religious studies. So I had those two jobs. I'm still doing those two jobs. And I was uh, basically the Protestant guy in the PhD program in theology. I, I was it. Uh, me and if you know uh, Brad Kallenberg, he's the other one, but you know, there aren't many Protestants in that who teach in that program. And um, I'll say more about this when I talk at the end, but I will say right now that one of the funny things is that UD wore me down. 20 years at a Catholic school, things sunk in. Uh, but I will say that. Oh, it gets it. It gets it. Okay. Hi. <laughs> so my... You probably don't need the mic. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure I don't, actually. <laughs> um, so my story is very different uh, from Bill's. Um, I was actually born here in Dayton, um, not, not far from this campus, uh, to um, a couple who um, had a uh, sort of mixed religious faith marriage. My mother grew up Catholic on the south side of Chicago, and my father grew up Methodist in Park Ridge. Many of you know that's uh, very close to downtown Chicago. Uh, and they met at Bradley, uh, which is a school in Peoria, Illinois, and got married. And the terms that my father was not going to convert to Catholicism, but my mother very much wanted to be married in the church. And so the arrangement that the priest made or the, the way they negotiated that was that uh, my parents had to promise that their children would be baptized in the Catholic Church, even if they wouldn't be raised in it. Um, and so I was baptized at Incarnation uh, Church just down the road, down Far Hills um, in Centerville. Um, and shortly thereafter, we moved to Chicago, where I grew up. And uh, my parents stopped going to church by about, I remember this very well, that by the time we moved to Chicago, we weren't going to church anymore. And I don't, I wish I had asked them, they've both passed away since then, but um, I, my best guess on that is that they managed their religious differences by just not going. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I grew up basically baptized but unchurched, <laughs> right? And I knew zip, right? I didn't know anything about church. I had friends, like I knew people went to church because like the neighborhood would empty out on Sunday and I wouldn't be able to be with any of my friends. Right? And I knew, like, I had a Lutheran friend who, you know, got, went through CC, whatever it was, blah, 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 and I had no idea what that was, et cetera. But for whatever reason, um, I uh, 
knowing nothing about the Bible, really. I had one, but I didn't really know what it meant. Uh, I prayed every night. Um, for some reason, I just had this very strong uh, yearning to have a relationship with God, even though I really didn't know what that meant. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So then in my teen years, well, yeah, so I'm like an eighth, I'm in eighth grade, and my best friend's older brother was in high school, and he was participating in a youth group, this gigantic youth group. Um, in the northwest suburbs of Chicago um, that was attached to one of the first mega churches. Okay? And so uh, she talked me into going to this youth group. I really didn't have any idea what to expect. Um, and so hundreds, hundreds of uh, suburban kids in, in the Chicago area would show up at this thing every Thursday night and play games and hear rock music and then they'd get a message right at the end inside the YMCA gymnasium. So I went to that for a few years. I got very involved. Um, one of the oddest things about it is I didn't come out of there knowing much more about Christianity than I did going in because their idea at that time was you don't attract people by talking about <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> you attract them like with sports and rock music. And then anyway, it's a very odd thing. So uh, in my, I think it was like my sophomore year, uh, I went on a Thursday night and they did this thing which I had no idea what it was. They did this thing called an altar call. I didn't know what an altar call was. I didn't find that out until decades later. Uh, where we were all, so you know, they had the rock music, blah, 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 they turned, they, and then we had the message. And then at the end, it wasn't a sermon. You don't use churchy words like sermon, right? And you don't have pastors, right? They're, they're something else. Uh, at the end of the message, uh, they shut off the lights in the gymnasium. So I'm like sitting there in the dark, you know, in my little folding chair, right? <laughs> and, and what they tell us is that what they want to know is whether Jesus has come to us, right? And if he has, then, then we're really Christians and we can leave. So you can go into the other room and then people would pray for you and stuff like that. But if not, then you were supposed to stay. I guess, in, I don't know, like until Jesus came to you or I don't know. So I sat there for a really long time in the dark, you know, and I'm like, um, you know, and I thought, you know, I didn't really know what this meant, but I thought, I'm sure that if Jesus had come to me, I would know about it, <laughs> right? I would, it would have been like a big deal, right? If Jesus showed up and said, Sue, I want you to be a Christian, I would have been like, got it, right? <laughs> so I, um, it's a funny story, but it's also a really sad story. So I left. And I figured, well, you know, I've been going to this church. By that time, my parents, actually, I can't believe I got my parents to go to church. They were going. Um, so I was doing the Thursday night thing, Sunday, you know, worship. And then we had the special core group meetings. I, went, I mean, I was really into it, right? And then I thought, well, I mean, after all this time, I mean, if, if that's the test, right? I mean, if that's the question, and Jesus hasn't come, then he must not be interested. Uh, so I felt forsaken. Um, I thought that this just meant that I wasn't capable of being a Christian. So I didn't go back to church. I was rather, um, I kept praying, but I didn't go back to church uh, for many years. Um, and then when I was in graduate school, uh, I met uh, my first husband, who um, was, who, who, well, I think like we went to a movie and out to dinner or something like that, and then the next thing you know, he's saying, no, I want you to go to church with me. I thought, oh, don't make me go to church. I, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to church and find out once again Jesus still isn't interested, okay? Uh, but I went, um, and I uh, joined. He was uh, a member. He was a Mennonite. He was raised in, the, uh, uh, in Ohio's Amish country. Um, in eastern Ohio, and uh, grew up very, very conservative Mennonite. Uh, Mennonites are um, an interesting uh, Christian group. They come out of the Reformation. They're Protestant. They're sort of between Protestant and Catholic. They're a little bit unusual. Um, but anyway, so they have um, a strong commitment to peace witness. They are really, really focused on discipleship. Discipleship is probably the, one of the, I mean, is one of the most important um, aspects of their faith. Uh, there were, you know, the cousins to the Amish, 
And in fact, if you had met my first husband um, when he was growing up, you would have thought he was Amish based on the way he was dressed. Very plain, that sort of thing. Anyway, so, um, so I became a Mennonite um, and was one for about 15, 20, 15, 18 years, something like that. Um, and it was interesting. I mean, I really liked the theology of the Mennonite church uh, because uh, we were both very much committed to peace. That was really important to me. I liked the emphasis on discipleship, that, we, that service is, is crucial. I really liked that. Um, there's some really wonderful theologians who are Mennonites, John Howard Yoder in particular. Anyway, so this was, interestingly, it was a very kind of intellectual faith that I had. Um, I was really attracted to the theology and, um, and enjoyed the work of the church and that sort of thing. Um, I became actually, yeah, I became um, a professor at a Mennonite school even, a very small uh, Mennonite school um, north of here. And that is where I met this guy, actually. Um, so we, were, we both lived in a small town, and I was teaching there, and he was teaching here and commuting. We were friends at that time, uh, good friends at that time. And over the course of about 10 years uh, while we were living there, um, toward the end in particular in my case, but anyway, uh, our marriages came apart. Um, at the same time, and it was uh, very, as you can imagine, divorces, you know, marriages coming apart, it's dreadful, no matter how it happens, and ours certainly were painful. I just thought, uh, nothing fun about it. Um, and in the course of that, uh, we discovered that we were not just really good friends, but that we were soulmates. Um, and so, uh, so we came together and have been blissful ever since. It's true, we have. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> one of the tough things, though, that, that we experienced was, we were both at the Mennonite church there, um, was that uh, with such an emphasis on discipleship in the Mennonite church, what I learned and I, I didn't really know until this very difficult time was that there's really not an emphasis on grace. Um, the crucial thing is that one live right. And divorce isn't included <laughs> in living right um, in, in that church. And so that was very painful. Um, and um, I really thought that I would remain a Mennonite uh, through that divorce time. And I realized that I couldn't. That um, largely because I think they didn't want me. Right? And that was very painful. But we had, and so this is the very dark time, right? The very, very dark time. Um, but as our title would indicate, right, there was grace in it too. For me, one of the big parts of it was um, uh, God was there um, in, a very, in very powerful ways. Um, I prayed all the time during that time um, out loud, and God um, helped me figure out how to restore my life um, out of the darkness, and that was huge. That was huge. We also had angels, right? They were good friends who, who really took care of us. That's especially true in Bill's case. Um, and then um, UD <laughs> welcomed us uh, together um, here um, and invited me to join the faculty, and that was a huge uh, moment of grace. Um, so that was huge. We, um, do you want to tell the story of how you, how we came to First Baptist Church? Be just because it's such a great story. Do you want to say a little bit about that for your, sem of your, your graduate seminar? And then, then finish it. Okay, that sounds great. So the, the Mennonites had no room for either of us. So um, we then, again, uh, yeah. in the church or something, and I was teaching a PhD seminar in theology, and we have a lot of Protestant, we don't have Protestant professors, but we have a lot of Protestant students in the program, and I, uh, the first night of the class, I said, we're going to start, and everybody has to say something about their faith life, you have to say something so I know how to teach this class, 
And I said, I'll say something too. And I spoke at the end and said something about what I care about. And after the class, three PhD students said, you have to come to this church downtown called First Baptist Church. Now I grew up in a Baptist church. There wasn't a chance, there wasn't a chance in hell that I was returning to a Baptist church. I did not want that. I was, but they were such persuasive young men and I was irritated, but I went. And it turned out to be fabulous, uh, especially in our situation. First, the uh, pastor, uh, Rod Kennedy, was uh, great. His sermons were great. He was committed to social justice. That was terrific. And then there were people there who took care of us. We both ended up at First Baptist. They took care of us. And um, we ended up in a small group with these people who, through our, all our tough times, uh, they took care of us. But um, it's not that we felt at home. We felt at home with the, those people who took care of us, and we loved listening to Rod, but it wasn't where we wanted to be, and we knew that if Rod ever left, we were going. When Rod announced his retirement last September, we knew we were headed out. Where we were headed, well, we weren't sure, but we weren't going to stay in that church. Uh, but where we wanted to be, actually, what we realized was in the Catholic Church. We realized that. Um, UD had worn both of us down. I remember when I came here for my interview, remember I, uh, as a, coming from an evangelical Protestant school, and uh, somebody came up to me and said, does this really seem like a Catholic school to you? <laughs> And you got to know, man, if you're coming from evangelical <laughs> Protestantism, this seems unbelievably Catholic. <laughs> and, the, you know, UD wore us down uh, teaching in the um, teaching and core program um, where we get to teach uh, church history. Uh, that wore me down, being around such good people wore me down. But also, as Sue said, UD was a place of grace for us. Um, people... Uh, took care of us. So um, when we got the chance, we met with uh, Father Satish at Immaculate Conception Parish in November. And um, uh, he, uh, he's a very persuasive guy. And he made it clear that we, uh, yes, we were welcome into the church. Um, what was, and, and we joined last Easter. Um, Kind of amazing. <laughs> it's a weird thing. It's amazing. So, and an incredible experience. Huh? And an incredible experience. Yes, yes. Um, so the question is why uh, this was, we were clear about this being the last stop in the journey, um, faith journey for us. Well, it's all sorts of things. It's the Eucharist. Uh, that comes from being here at UD. I was envious of that, the way that people here talked about the Eucharist. Um, if sacraments in general. I'm also, I'm a historian, and the history, the tradition, uh, I was tired of being in churches that always seemed like they were making it up as they went. I didn't, I didn't want that. Um, so it's that, it's, um, but it's also grace. Not only the grace that, Amac, that uh, UD showed us, but also the grace that's built into um, Catholicism terms of confession and reconciliation. Uh, that was very important to us. And then finally, uh, we were in RCIA class. Uh, Satish let us join halfway through. That's how we uh, were able to become, I mean, we were at First Baptist at the end of December last year, and I see the beginning of January. And we started in RCIA, and it was an incredible experience. I didn't had no idea what to expect. We were the only academics in there. And it was a big class, probably 40. Mm -hmm. 40 joined, and 40, and so you had to tell your, people told their personal stories, and the personal stories were incredible, yeah. and they were all stories about grace. These were real human beings who were really messed up in one way or another, and they felt great. There was a, the, a young woman told this great story. Um, she had, in her adolescence, her family had bad times. She never explained what happened, but they were homeless, <clears throat> so she lived on the streets. Uh, as a teenager, um, 
and was able to get out of that status, get her life together. Um, uh, and she started going to an evangelical church, a mega church. And they were very good to her. But she had to quit going because the people who cared for her on the street for years were the drug dealers and the prostitutes. They're the ones who cared for her when she was 13 and 14 and 15. And what she realized at her church was those people weren't welcome. And she felt like a traitor to the people who cared for her. So she left and she ended up at Immaculate Conception. But hers is just one story. There were many stories. Um, so for us, becoming Catholic is an intellectual thing. It's an emotional thing. And it's, a, it's grace filled. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, that's, is Corinne coming up? Yes, you are. Okay. Throughout your faith journey and like all the struggles and roadblocks that you felt, what kept you going? Like what, how did you get to this point with all the like roadblocks you had? <laughs> like what kept you wanting to keep searching for that faith? That's a great question. Um, it may be unanswerable. <laughs> um, I think in some ways it's just it was a, a yearning that I had that I just could not ignore. And I think, I mean, I would, I would tell the story that God kept putting things into my life that kept getting me back. Like I remember you know, my grandmother bought me a Bible and I didn't know why. But, you know, just, you know, people just did things or, you know, somebody says, you know, come on, let's go to church or, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I have to give that over to the Holy Spirit, right, that the Holy Spirit just kept showing up and, um, and she was right. I was interested. I just didn't always know how to find my way. Do you want to add to that? You feel good? Okay. <laughs> uh, do you think it was the Marianist aspect of mm. sort of Catholicism that you especially with their commitment to social justice that sort of changed your perspective? I'll, <clears throat> I'll answer it this way. I'm very aware, and this is part of this comes from what I do is American religious history, right? So I'm very aware that there are places in the Catholic Church that are not grace-filled, right? I know that, right? Um, but that may be true. But it's not, it has not been my experience here. And I suspect that at least some of that is due to the Marianists. Mm -hmm. And um, I should have mentioned, a few of you may know this, but uh, Father Satish at Immaculate Conception has his PhD from our theology program. And so um, you can feel that same sort of thing over at Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. That said, you know, we have visited a number of parishes. It's been great fun. I, I left out one of the things I love about being Catholic is I love the global church. It's I just okay. love it. It's fantastic. Tell them about your app. Yeah, I've got, I've got the Mass Times app. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that thing. Man. You go to a city and pop it in. I can't believe it, right? And he always, he, he always explains about it. He's like, look at this, honey. There are 15 Catholic churches within two miles of this hotel. I love it. I love it's it. amazing. That's it. <laughs> Um, and in virtually every one we visited, I have felt a sense of grace. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm just saying it's a human institution. There are places where it's not grace-filled. I'm very aware of that. But I think there are, the Marianists have something to do with it. So a lot of conversations I have with people who don't happen to be Catholic, um, particularly, I think, most notably in the last couple of years, it's pretty obvious how how much sort of the agnostic movement has grown and how many people nowadays are sort of just unsure about just religion and faith in general. Obviously, with in your lives, you've experienced sort of that search and that call. What would you say to, because I'll, I'll talk to these people, I'll have conversations with these people who are searching, and I don't know what to tell them because, you know, I'm, I'm a cradle Catholic. I've, my whole life I've only known, you know, one religion. Um, and sure, there is a bit of a search that comes with that, with any sort of mm -hmm. faith. What would you say, though, to those people who, 
we're self-proclaimed as agnostic or um, maybe not, just in general, people who are searching for something else. Hmm. Do you want to answer that one, then? <laughs> <laughs> you're, the, you're, the, you're like the, yeah, go ahead. You're the, no. Yeah, I'd love to. Yep. That's a tough one. Well, first, I don't think there's a simple. Yeah. I think I don't. I, I had the same problem when I run into that. That's it's not an easy thing. Um, my experience has been that some of the best Christians are agnostics and atheists, and so I think that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and in fact, uh, sometimes I mean we we wrote a book on some people who are, sometimes aren't very Christian, who are self-proclaimed Christians, right? So part of it is the recognition that, um, in a sense, we're all together, right? But when I taught at the evan evangelical school, I had a lot of fundamentalist students. Didn't realize they weren't coming to a fundamentalist school, and they would take some of my classes, and a number of them had, I mean dozens, had this crisis moment where they realized that fundamentalism was wrong, that you can't talk about the Bible being literally true, easily read, literally true, that doesn't work, or you can't say that the founding fathers were evangelical or something like that, right? And then when that brick would be pulled out, the whole edifice of fundamentalism would just fall apart. And then they'd come into my office and they were proclaiming themselves to be agnostic or atheist at that moment. I, I can't tell you how often this happened. And so I'll tell you what my advice was. Now, I'm not saying it, would work in, it, it wouldn't work in all situations, but to those students, what mm -hmm. I said was, you don't understand how gigantic Christianity is and how varied it is. So what I want you to do is, and I would give them a list of churches, including Catholic churches, and say, I want you to go sit. Just go and sit. You don't have to believe a word. You don't have to do anything. I want you to go sit. Sometimes that worked over time. Sometimes it didn't. So I, I think it's a great question. I feel a little less despair about this because of my experience of these. Mm -hmm. My brother is uh, so, an agnostic, or he says he is. He's not telling the truth. <laughs> He's not agnostic. <laughs> He's actually a believer. I have run into a number of agnostics mm -hmm. who, if you push them hard enough, you discover they, mm -hmm. they hold to much more than they indicate. Mm -hmm. that's right? true. So that's not a super hopeful answer, but it's the best I could find talked a little bit about this, but how do you see um, your academic life leading into your um, faith life? Um, and this can include your most recent book, if you want to make a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Writing America the Creation of Ego. <laughs> That's a title, whatever. Um, <laughs> oh gosh, it's very deeply uh, interwoven, um, has been for uh, a very long time. Um, Well, I'll just say a little bit bi autobiographically, and then you can maybe want to add. Um, so, so I married this guy who uh, was this very conservative Mennonite, and we went to visit his family. And you know, here I'm, you know, gal from Chicago. You know, did my PhD in Pittsburgh, and I show up in, in you know, in um, Amish country, and spend a great deal of time with uh, the, his parents, who are very conservative Mennonites. That's right. Um, and so I think this is somewhat similar to your story I, there, it, it, in that um, I was obliged to come to know these people, right? Um, they were very, very different from me. One of the things I learned, we make up a lot of jokes about this, is that I learned about bywords. <laughs> I'd never heard of bywords before. I, mean, I don't think anybody here has heard of Okay, have you ever heard of, anyone ever heard of a byword? Me neither. I didn't know what that was either. But anyway, so I was in grad school and, you know, I swore now and then, you know, I was writing a dissertation, so I swore. Um, and, right, and so, but you know, but when I go to visit his parents, it's like, you can't say, you know, right? You can't, you can't, you can't even say, oh my God, right? You can't, Whoa, that's out. I mean, that, you say that, everyone will be like, oh. Uh, so, I, so I'd say, gosh, 
I'd say, oh my gosh, right? And I'm kind of an energetic, enthusiastic person, so I would say a lot, right? And then I found out that that's a byword. Gosh is a byword, it's a stand-in, right? A byword is a stand-in for a word you shouldn't say, and substituting a byword for a word you shouldn't say isn't much better. So it's like I was swearing all the time to these people, and I thought I was being really polite, right? <laughs> I thought that I was like really restraining myself you know, because I wasn't actually saying the sh you know, whatever, <laughs> right? <laughs> Something out anyway. Um, so you know, so it was quite a cross-cultural experience um, for me, and I decided to uh, to write about it. So my first book is um, is about uh, tourism in Amish country, and I spent 15 years right learning all about the Amish and. Uh, and writing this book. I mean, so for me, it's, and for you as well, it's just been woven in, and it makes life very rich, right? I mean, to ask, I mean, to study the Amish is, is fascinating. It raises wonderful questions about, like, who you are, and why do you live the way that you do, and why, you know, you know why do you take your commitments seriously enough? Or are you really just kind of an average American who, says that they have special commitments, but really doesn't live any differently than anyone else. Um, and so what a, I mean, what a fabulous education. And then this guy got me to write about the Creation Museum, <laughs> which is not uplifting. <laughs> but anyway, but we'll leave it at that, yes. So this uh, true story about this book that we just put out, um, it's, you, as the book goes along, anybody who's discerning will figure out that we have Christian commitments. It's pretty clear. And, as the, and at the end of the book, in the final chapter, in the final few pages, we, without saying, without announcing we are religious, uh, we basically do that in our final critique of the Creation Museum. So uh, my mentor, it's hard to believe he's still, still alive, he's still my mentor at the University of Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> we sent him the draft of the manuscript. And he read it, oh, yeah. and he loved it. But he said, Johns Hopkins is going to make you pull out things like this. They're not going to put out a university press book that is that explicit. Well, we decided we were just going to go with it. And, you know, I don't know if the, <laughs> if the editor actually read the whole manuscript. Did he quit the last chapter? I don't know. Because we didn't change anything. Um, and which we're really happy about. We're really, we're really happy we got in there. I still haven't figured out if Hopkins knows how his book ends. I don't know, just sell. That's what they care about now. Sell it, and then we'll be, they'll be fine. But our faith commitments are just very much part both of our teaching and our research and writing. It's all of a piece, it's all together, which is fun. But when you talk about fundamentalism and how students realize that it was mm. wrong, um, and how you've been through so many different churches and you, like, you couldn't end point now with Catholicism, so how do you feel about like those churches you've been in, I guess, and like, are they possible homes for other people mm. and stuff like that, I guess, or like, can you see them giving maybe like a different kind of grace to other people, or? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, right. Um, so I have to be really clear, and I know you would agree with this. For us, Catholicism is home. But I'm not presuming to speak for anybody else. And there's no question that other locations are um, homes for others. So for, I'll give you an example. I have a, a a brother-in-law who grew up Catholic, and he went the other direction and became evangelical. And we met with them to tell them of our conversion. I wasn't sure how he would be, he was fantastic. But I realized in talking to Dave that he has found his mm -hmm. home, he has his home. So, I mean, one thing that neither of us can do is be judgmental about someone else's faith journey. I, that's just out. But I can't be evangelical. I can say that too. Well, and, and we like making the argument for where we ended up. Yep. Like, I'm cool with that. <laughs> People don't have to buy it, but I'm she, happy to make she it. She is cool with making the argument. <laughs> oh. Great. So, have you met, um, or I guess, like, have you received much opposition from people that you might have met when you were evangelical or when you were Mennonite? Like, have they tried to convince you that Catholicism wasn't where you needed to be and 
then how did you deal with what they were trying to, um, or I guess like how they were trying to persuade you? So our uh, separation from the Mennonite community that we were in was fairly uh, abrupt and thorough. Um, and so the, one of the blessings of that is that those folks haven't seen fit to try to tell us we shouldn't be Catholic. Um, but, but actually, I mean, the folks that we, I, I was, the folks that actually when I told my first husband because we have, uh, I have two children, we have two children from that marriage, um, that we were doing this and, and wasn't sure how he would respond, he was great. You know? um, so that was fantastic. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a mix. But I'm, um, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I don't really have a very coherent answer to this question. Do you have something you want to add? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've had resist I've had resistance. See, I, because I write in evangelical history. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of people writing on evangelicals are evangelicals. Yeah. And I was president of the National uh, Conference on Faith and History, which is made of, has a, not all evangelicals, but a lot of them are evangelicals. And so some of those folks um, have not been happy. Uh, I don't try to, uh, in that situation, I don't try to make an argument. I will say something like we said here tonight about what attracts us to Catholicism, uh, but um, I don't push it more than that. Um, I have learned that the divide between, uh, I used to think that the divide between Protestantism and Catholicism had all but disappeared, and it's clear to me now uh, that that is not the case, that that divide remains. So at some point, there isn't, you know, okay, you can't handle that, and you just have to let that go. You two mentioned that you had, you shared this common um, desire, this yearning to find your home um, in whatever faith mm -hmm. tradition uh, that you wanted to choose. But do you think that your shared yearning what some like played a part in what drew both of you together in the first mm, place? May I say something about that? She wants to answer this. No <laughs> question. <laughs> yes, no question. Um, another thing that Bill and I share, which uh, is very difficult, is that we lost all of our parents young. Um, and so I, Bill and I, I think one of the reasons that we were such good friends um, all those, those 10 years was that we didn't know anybody else who had lost their parents as young as we had. And um, so we were comrades in that grief and struggle. And we talked about it and we talked about our faith life in connection with how to understand that and how uh, when your parents, if any of you have had this experience, when your parents die too young, um, mortality just becomes this very present feature of your life, right? I mean, it's just in a way that it isn't, wasn't anyway for us before that. Um, and so, yeah, that definitely we would have long phone conversations trying to, you know, figure all that out. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think that was a way, one of the early ways in which we discovered that we became such dear friends. I think that was crucial. It also meant that we developed um, a very dark sense of humor. <laughs> and, and we have had to learn to, to hold on to that in certain places. And it comes from this. We would, you know, talk about, about um, the imminence of death. Yeah. And we would joke. And people would think that we're being morbid. And we weren't being morbid. We're just coping. We're just coping with the fact. Our moms have been gone for 25 years. So uh, we were just, we just, that was coping. Uh, but it was a big part of our friendship. Yeah. Um, for anybody else going through like the discernment of Catholicism or like mm. research, what advice do you have for these people? I'll go right ahead, yeah. So I, I left this out of, of explaining evangelicalism, but thanks, Cole, because you give me a chance to say this. Um, Growing up as I did um, in evangelicalism, uh, another big part of it is this notion of uh, believing 
certain mm -hmm. uh, propositions, and that if you believe these certain propositions about the, um, the faith, that saves you, right? And there'd be this certain things. Um, there is no there is no one list of fundamentals. They're different in different churches, but. I grew up thinking that's what faith was. Mm -hmm. If I could just get my belief system right, okay? So my advice uh, regarding Catholicism is to recognize, and this is, I've got this from uh, our good friend Bill Portier in the Religious Studies Department, um, that Catholicism is, um, as Bill would say, it's a world, it's a practice, it's a way of being, and, um, that is one of the huge attractions of Catholicism to us. Um, I cannot, propositional faith, where it just all comes down to you get these right I, things right, these ideas right, and then, then you're quote unquote saved, I, could, I can't bear that. So my first thing is, is to help people, especially people coming out of my, the tradition I grew up in, which is the big one in the United States, evangelicalism is the big one, um, is to help them understand that it isn't just about right beliefs but it's about immersing yourself in this world. And there may be times, oh, I just thought of what I would say, what I have said to agnostics, okay? It just occurred to me that um, it's not, you may not always believe everything intellectually. You may have doubt, Mother Teresa had major doubts, right? And so uh, that would be my emphasis. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that was certainly very helpful for me. I'll just ask anything super quick and anything. Super quick. Super quick. Okay. Super, super quick. Um, <laughs> um, I, my advice would be pray. Um, talk to God and do it out loud. Listen to yourself talking to God and hear what God says through your voice. Okay, let's have another round of applause. <laughs> oh,